Community Church. We're so glad that you decided to join us today. If you're a guest with us, we would love to connect with you and get you information about New Hope Church and let you know about our ministries. So if you would, grab that connect card that's in the seat right in front of you and fill that out. Put that in the offering plate as it comes by and we make you a couple promises. We're not gonna come knock on your door and bother you that way. We're not even gonna bother you on the phone. We just wanna send you in the mail some information about what New Hope Church is all about. Well, it's that time of the year again. No, not Christmas. No, not my birthday. But Easter, the best time of the year when we can celebrate what Jesus did for us. And this year we have two amazing choirs. The first one will be on Palm Sunday, and that's our kids, our gorgeous little kids that sing and they do such a great job every year. The signups are going around today, so if you have your own children or your grandchildren or you want to volunteer somebody else's kid, sign up for them and the, uh, look to your bulletin for when the start dates for those rehearsals start, but they'll be singing Palm Sunday. And then the next week on Easter Sunday, our adult choir will be singing. The signups are also going around today, so please, even if you've never been in one before, even if you don't think you can sing or you're not talented, none of that matters because what we're doing, we're doing to honor Jesus. So sign up and um, the, the rehearsals for the adult choir start on February 21st. But we look forward to seeing you all out there to sing and celebrate for Jesus. Here at New Hope Community Church, we have a passion and a desire to compellingly communicate the all sufficiency of Jesus Christ who meets our every need. We have midweek Bible studies that help do that. We also have our midweek jam sessions that are coming up. I'm so excited about this. This is a chance where all of the kids come together for a midweek study from seven to eight for the study. And check this out, there's family dinner, man. Come have food at 6.15. The study starts at 7. I would love to have you come be a part of that if you have kids. Hey, and Tuesday, February 13th, we have a Prime Timers Luncheon. If you don't know what Prime Timers Luncheon is, that's for people who are 55 years and older. That's 55 and older, and you're all welcome. We'd love for you to come if it's your first time. If you're a regular, we really would like you to show. Come and bring a potluck entree or a dessert or both and let's have a great time of fellowship and uh, maybe some special activities that day hello ladies save the date saturday march the 3rd at 9 a.m right here at new hope in our bridge we're having a painting party dj from the denying sublime is going well she actually created a painting just especially for us to paint and she'll be here to walk us through it now you don't have to be a painter i know we have several artists amongst us but you don't have to have any experience. You don't even have to be crafty, because I'm certainly not. But she can walk you through it, and you're gonna have your own masterpiece that you can take home. We're gonna have a great time. Our tickets will go on sale next Sunday, the 18th, out in the pavilion. The tickets are $35 a piece, and we might be limited. If we get full, she's gonna try to do a second one, but get your tickets early to ensure you get a good seat. As the youth pastor, I get the incredible opportunity to go down to Mexico every year for our annual Mexico missions trip. Well, guess what? It's coming up, people. We have our mandatory Mexico training meetings. If you're a part of Team Mexico and you are a student part of Team Mexico, training meetings start today. So be here to make sure you get that $100 discount. Mandatory Mexico training meetings today. Can't wait to see you there right after church, 1230. Ladies, it's that time of year again, retreat time. This year's retreat will be April 20th through the 22nd. And we are going again to Calvin Crest. So you can register today, go online to the Calvin Crest and you can go ahead and pick your, your room, whether you wanna be in the lodge or a cabin. So again, don't hesitate to get your room you want and your roommate go online today to register. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're so glad that you're here. It is our prayer and our desire that you would experience Jesus today, that it be new and refreshing, that it just be something that you need, that God just move powerfully in your life today. Now, would you do me a huge favor and welcome our pastor of Care Ministries, Pastor Steve Brown, come on.
Well, good morning, everybody. It's nice to have you all here. And I got to tell you how much different you look from this perspective. <laughs> uh, I want to welcome you this morning and, and tell you that we are, in fact, grateful for having you here, whether you come every week or whether this is your first time. And as I mentioned, fill out a Connect card. Let us know you're here. Uh, I have clipboards this morning. And while you've just sung one song and you're about to join us in worship, let me take this clipboard and the opportunity to remind you that our Easter choir is going to minister to us in just a few weeks. And Milo would love to have you join the choir. Yes, he would. <laughs> and it doesn't matter whether you think you can sing or not. If you can make a joyful noise, you can be a part of the choir. Um, and our pastor does that by leading in that very thing. So please join us. His, his willingness to make a joyful noise is one of the things that attracted my wife and I here. Uh, how many years ago? It's been a few. <laughs> and it was one of the things that attracted us here because of the purity of the worship. So feel free to be a part of that and join. I'm going to hand you that clipboard and, and I'm going to watch and see how many of you actually sign it. <laughs> In our first hour, many of our folks over there are uh, prime timers. That's what they are. They're prime timers. And yet we had some sign up today. So I know y'all can do it too. Um, I just want to remind you of a few prayer requests that are in your bulletin. You can see these. Barbara Belcher is having surgery tomorrow. So be praying for Barbara. Uh, Bill Burmeister went into, uh, began hospice care this week. So be praying for Bill, but also be praying for Barbara. Uh, it's a difficult time, but a blessed time for both of them in many ways. So keep them in your prayers. Um, you can read the rest of them. Frank Hicks. Frank, I believe, has changed addresses now. He's now gone to an assisted living facility, we believe, uh, Cottonwood Court, which is at Millbrook and Alluvial. And uh, that's going to be really good for him and for Bobette. So be praying for both of them. Uh, Louise Ward, who had, a, I think, a TIA last week, and uh, she's doing much better. Um, by phone, I talked to her. Uh, be praying for Brenda Watson. And then be praying for our, our Africa team. They're basically halfway through their, uh, their trip to Ivory Coast. And I have an update. I want to tell you about some of the things that are going on over there. Uh, Pastor Mark and Pastor Tim have both already preached today. Mark preached to about 200 people in the village he was at. Uh, Pastor Tim got preached to 120. Now, I know there were eight baptisms in the village that Tim was in. Woo, is right. Amen, huh? So things are going well over there. The, the Kids Fest is complete, and I understand that there were a lot of kids saved in, during Kids Fest. Construction on the cantina is done, and dedication is Wednesday. This cantina will seat 60 to 70 people, and all the items are uh, supplied for the cafeteria setup. That's part of our fundraiser here. We, we do that. That's part of what we do as, as a church, as a church body. It's part of your way of ministering internationally, in this particular case with 1040i and the Ivory Coast. So thank you for that. Continue to be thinking about that. Be generous and uh, be involved. Um, those of you who know of Fidel, his surgery was a success on his arm. Uh, speaking of surgeries, there were 50 life-changing surgeries this last week. A few of them were life-saving. Uh, 25 cataract surgeries, 125 non-surgical procedures, and there are still three more days of surgeries to go. So keep that all in prayer. They're having a great impact over there. And finally, just remember the team. Our team is doing well. There are no illnesses. They're all being strong and healthy, and uh, they've got three more days of ministry. So pray for their strength and their vigor to continue. Um, his little feet... Oh, that's my little feet. Sorry. His Little Feet is an, uh, a multicultural choir of children that will be here with us next Sunday evening. And they're going to come here and minister to us in music and in testimony. And I think that's going to be a program that you really would like to see. So think about it. Put it on your calendar. Plan on being here next Sunday evening for His Little Feet. And then finally, it's our time to give back to the Lord. So I'm going to ask our ushers to prepare, and uh, they're going to take up our morning offerings and tithes and gifts back to the Lord. Would you pray with me? 
Father, we are so grateful for the privilege of being able to be here today to worship, to praise, to study, to learn. And we thank you for the fact that we can do that freely here. And we can do it with people leading us like Pastor Tim and Pastor Mark, who happen to not be here today. But yet we have that access every week. And the folks in Ivory Coast do not necessarily have that access. So we thank you that we can share their knowledge and expertise with, with them in uh, Ivory Coast. Lord, we thank you for what you do here. We thank you for the way that you finance things. And we pray that you'll continue to bless us uh, with a willingness to obey in helping do those things. Thank you for this morning's worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Wow. wow. Amen. And the trump shall sound, and the doors of heaven shall open wide, and all of his children shall be called home. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Amen. Wow. That's a good way to open a, a message. Uh, speaking of doors, flying open. That's what we've been talking about for a few weeks, and here is doors. Now, I don't have the props up here we had in the first service. Uh, if you haven't been in there, we have two doors on the stage up there. It's kind of a... A visual reminder of the fact that God places doors and opens them for us. So we've been talking about doors that he opens and doors that he closes and doors that he allows us even to open for others. And today we're going to talk a little bit about how we should react to those doors. Because, see, when we have a door, we have a, a decision to make. Are we going to go through the door or not. Now, sometimes the doors that God opens, how do I say this gently? They're not fun, yeah. you know? And sometimes they're not even safe, at least in our measure. But they are always something about something greater than us, greater than our comfort, greater than our benefit. They're about God and his compassion. Our first song here, Spirit Come Down. I, I don't remember if that's the right title or not. I wish I had the lyrics back up there. But that's kind of what God wants us to be focused on today. Now, a, a few weeks ago, Pastor Tim gave us some descriptions of open door people. And before we get into today's message, I just I want to remind us of what open door people, what their characteristics are. First of all, they're ready. Ready or not. Secondly, they're unhindered by uncertainty. They don't really sit and, mm, should I or shouldn't I? They're blessed to bless. They feel like they're fulfilled when they're blessing others. Open door people resist and persist. What do they resist? Opposition to his word. And they persist in delivering the gospel. Open door people have fewer regrets and they learn more about themselves. And finally, open door people are not paralyzed by their imperfections. Some of you think you can't carry a tune, so you won't join the Easter choir. <laughs> Do not be paralyzed by the fact that you can't carry a tune and join the Easter choir. Some of us want to be paralyzed by the fact that we can't hear, so we carry those little devices in here that help amplify things. And sometimes they don't work really well. Sometimes it's our eyesight that's an imperfection. But I'm blind, deaf, and, well, I won't go there, but... <laughs> <laughs> but we all have imperfections. We can't let those paralyze us from doing what God calls us to do. Now, with those descriptions that Pastor Tim has given us in mind, is there anyone in here who has not heard the story of God's prophet, Jonah? You all know the story of Jonah, don't you? The, the story of a prophet of God instructed to go into an evil city and to preach God's word there, to preach God to the people of an evil city. The story of a recalcitrant prophet of God who, who didn't want to go through that door to that city, and he chose his own door. 
God opened other doors for him until God got what he wanted. It's a story about a, the prophet's reaction when he got what we find he expected, but it was not what he wanted. Most of us heard the story of Jonah and the whale since we were little kids. Even those of us who didn't grow up in church, and I didn't start going to church regularly at least until I was in college, but I heard the story of Jonah and the whale from my first grade teacher, in fact, who coincidentally just happened to be the Sunday school teacher at the Methodist church down the street. But we heard the story, and we heard about this guy that got swallowed by a fish, and we heard about the time he spent there. You see, in chapter 1 of the book of Jonah, our hero is running away from God. Of course, he gets caught. We all do when we run from God, don't we? Anybody here running that hasn't been caught yet? <laughs> but he got caught. He got tossed overboard from a boat, and then he got swallowed by a great fish. In chapter 2, though, we find out he's running back to God. He's got a, a change of heart. And he prays to God and apologizes for his disobedience and asks for God's forgiveness. And then he goes through the door that God originally opened for him and told him to go through. And he goes to Nineveh. In chapter 3, we find him in Nineveh, and he does the job that God commanded for him. And then that chapter, chapter 3, ends with a great revival. And now our hero is not running from God or to God. He's running with God. And the people of Nineveh, even the foreign evil king, have repented. According to Scripture, they all repented. And they turned from their evil ways. In verse 10 of, of that chapter, it says, God relented from the disaster he said he would do to them. And he would not do it. God had promised that he was going to destroy that city if they didn't turn from their ways. But he relented when they repented. Now, for most of us, the book of Jonah could have ended right there at the end of chapter 3, right? It's a happy ending. Uh, it's a perfect ending. There's repentance. There's evangelism. There's a response to the evangelism. So it's a perfect way to end, right? Well, we know that the book of Jonah doesn't exactly end that way. In chapter 4, instead of running from God or to God or with God, Jonah runs right smack dab into God. And from the very beginning, this story speaks of God's problem controlling his disobedient prophet. In chapter 2, God does control a great fish. In chapter 3, he gains control of the entire city of Nineveh. But in chapter 4, he's still trying to get his reluctant prophet back in line. He's trying to set his heart straight, trying to get his compassion for people restoked. The entire book chronicles a contest of wills between God and Jonah. Today we're going to profile Jonah, Jonah the prophet. And we profile people sometimes uh, to get a picture of, of what, who they are and what they're doing and to contrast that to others or to contrast it to ourselves and to see are we the same as or different than? Well, I'm going to start by reading today's text. Uh, Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 11. If you'd like to follow along, feel free to do that. I think Milo's going to try and get, up, get it up on the screen so you can see it too. Before I do, though, I have a little disclaimer. Any resemblance of this profile to any person living or dead is purely on purpose. <laughs> now remember in Jonah chapters 1 through 3, Jonah had preached the gospel in Nineveh. People repented and came to God. And then in chapter 4, verse 1, it starts right off and it says, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly. <laughs> and he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my country? That's why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Oh, therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, 
for it is better for me to die than to live. We find out that Jonah's a crybaby here. Uh, and the Lord said, do you do well to be angry? Jonah when, when then went out of the city, and he sat to the east of the city and made a booth for himself there. And he sat under it in the shade till he could see that what would become of the city. In other words, he's testing God. Are you going to destroy it or not? And now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when the dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die again. It is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, oh, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to what? Die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left? Oh, Jonah. We should take a look first at Jonah's passion. And unfortunately, Jonah's passion does not appear to be a passion for the lost. <laughs> at least not a passion for the lost in Nineveh. His passion appears to be anger. Verse 1 said, It displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he was angry. Now, God had just used Jonah to create one of the greatest revivals in history in Nineveh. And the whole city was converted. Not just a few people. It says the whole city was converted. And yet Jonah is angry? I have to tell you, if I had the opportunity to preach to a city, first of all, to a whole city, <laughs> and the whole city came to know the Lord, I, I could not find it in my heart to be angry. But Jonah was apparently guilty of preaching from a selfish heart and a self-serving agenda. And when revival happened, he got mad. Now, in Old Testament Hebrew, the word anger means to boil or to burn. And Jonah's hot. Why? Does he think God made him look bad? Uh, Jonah had said that the, the city would perish in 40 days. And God said, never mind. No. Well, maybe Jonah thought God was making himself look bad because God had said he would destroy the whole city. And yet he's reneged on that judgment now. He promised Nineveh that he would destroy it if it did not repent. See, actually, Jonah's anger here is centered more on Jonah. He was sinfully angry. The New Testament tells us, be angry, but sin not. <laughs> Jonah crossed that line. He didn't want those Assyrians to be saved. He hated them. They'd been a problem for him and a problem for his nation all along. And frankly, he hated them all. They weren't good enough for God's grace. What he wanted was for God to destroy them, not to show mercy on them. Does that attitude sound familiar? Oh, oh, you're not supposed to be squirming. No, it's not about you. Uh, it, it's about the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. Do you remember that? How angry he got when his brother repented, came to his senses, and came home. And was he angry at his brother? Nah, maybe a little bit, but who he was really angry at was his father and God because they welcomed him home. They were glad that he came home. His father was generous toward his prodigal brother, and they forgave him. Jonah's anger here is because that prodigal nation <laughs> has now turned toward God and their lives have been spared. God welcomed them home, and, well, frankly, Jonah just didn't like it. 
And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was yet in my own country? This is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish. For I knew that you are a gracious God, a merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love, and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O Lord, take my life from me, for it would be better for me to die than to live. Now I want to point out this is the second prayer in the book of Jonah. In a, in a very short book. The first was a prayer of confession and repentance that Jonah prayed in chapter 2. Where? In the belly of a fish. That might motivate you to pray. <laughs> but in part one of this unusual prayer, Jonah confesses to God why he didn't go to Tarshish in the, or go to Nineveh in the first place, which, of course, God knew. But he basically says, well, I knew too much. And he listed five characteristics of God, that God is gracious. Remember, he extends grace. Secondly, that God is merciful. Third, he's slow to anger. Thank goodness. Whew. And he is loving. It says he's abounding in steadfast love. And fifthly, God is relenting from disaster. These are things that Jonah knew about God. And his theology is pretty good here. He has the right image of God. I mean, he is a prophet of God, right? It's his experience, though, that when wicked change their attitude toward God and change their ways, God will forgive them. And that's why he didn't want to go to Nineveh to preach to begin with. He was afraid that if he went and preached God, those people would repent and God would forgive them. And he was angry that God would be compassionate on them. And now starts Jonah's pity party, a self-pity party, if you will. Verse 3, now, therefore, now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it would be better for me to die than to live. Oh, woe is me. Modern, modern behavioralists will tell you that for human beings, there's a direct connection between hatred for others and self-pity. If you remember, Elijah had a similar prayer in 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 4. Elijah had just defeated the prophets of Baal, and yet he's still on the run from Jezebel. And he's feeling a little discouraged and depressed and sorry for himself. And he says, it is enough. Now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. These guys keep wanting to take the easy way out. How many of us in here know what it means to be myopic? If you're, if you're nearsighted, you're myopic. But there is another use of the term myopic that means short-sighted. And that is what Jonah's problem was. He was short-sighted. He was so consumed with Jonah and what's best for Jonah, that all he could see was, oh, poor Jonah. And he was terribly short-sighted. And oftentimes, we in our generation aren't much better, are we? We get too a little self-focused. He couldn't see, and, and often we can't either, that the only way to get our needs met in life is to meet the needs of others. Now, recently I heard someone use an old quote by Zig Ziglar, on how to be a successful leader. They said, successful leadership is not getting people to do what you want. Success will come from helping them get what they want. And when you start thinking about that, wow, that's kind of revolutionary. Jonah would overcome his hatred of the Assyrians only by serving them, by taking the gospel of the Lord to them for salvation. Now, that leads us to Jonah's problem. God asked him, he confronted him, he says, do you do well to be angry? That's God's way of saying, Jonah, do you really have the right to be mad right now? 
See, God's reaction here to Jonah is the same gracious, merciful, slow to anger, loving response that he had just had toward those wicked Ninevites. His question is designed to move Jonah back to a place of compassion, a right relationship with him. But Jonah, all he could do was protest and pout. He now, now he's into a full pout. He's so angry at God that he, was, he does not even answer God. He just sits there and pooches out that lip. I'm not speaking to you. He stomps off to his room, slams the door, puts on his headphones, pick up the game controller, and waits to see what God's going to do. Oh, no, that's wrong. I'm sorry. That's, that's the wrong adolescent. He just waits and stomps off outside the city, makes himself a nice shady place where he'll wait to see what God's going to do to Nineveh. Would he destroy it or would he not? He was surprised and, and kind of pouting like the Grinch when he found out that Christmas came to Whoville even without all the packages and ribbons and tinsels and bows. He just sat there and pushed out his lip. I don't understand. In verse 6, we read this. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. See, the Lord was concerned about Jonah too. The plant was specifically and miraculously provided so God could give Jonah some shade. And Scripture says Jonah was exceedingly glad for it. That is, he was very grateful for the shade. In spite of the fact that Jonah had been thrown off a boat, swallowed by a big fish, and then vomited back up out of the belly of the fish onto the shore, and saved from a, a pretty messy fate, being digested by a fish is kind of messy. And saved from all of this stuff, this is the first time in the book we, that we find Jonah that, is, that he's happy or thankful about anything. God's still working to get Jonah spiritually back where he needs to be. The plant and its shade was the first of three things that God used to move him in that direction. And verses 7 and 8 tell us what the second and third things were. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. Boy, worms and fish. God uses some weird tools, doesn't he? Now, when the sun arose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he again asked that he might die and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Oh, Jonah, you're a broken record. Here we go again. Back to the pity party. Just listen to him. Oh, come on, God. Why'd you do that for? If you were going to take it away, why'd you ever even give it to me? Boo-hoo. I hesitate to ask this, but aren't we like Jonah sometimes? We get all attached to the shade in our lives, and we allow it to get in the way of God's will. That is, we, we let it get between us and the doors that he's opening for us. We would do well to remember that God does shade plants, but he also does worms. <laughs> and he can do a pretty good scorching wind, too. And if we can't surrender our shade to the control of the Spirit, then we, be, we, we better be ready for a worm infestation. <laughs> and some of us have probably experienced those. And wind can get mighty hot sometimes, too, and uncomfortable. But again, verse 9, Jonah is pouting. But then God said to Jonah, Do you do well to be angry for the plant? And what did Jonah reply? Yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. <sighs> I'm ready to let him run off and put on his headphones and pick up the game controller. My dad would have said, I'll give you something to cry about. <laughs> God, amen, huh? 
God didn't do that. See, Jonah is he's on a he's on a roller coaster here. First he's mad, and then he's glad, and now he's mad again. But at least this time he's talking to God. And a conversation with God is certainly in order here. But Jonah's problem from the start was that he knew a lot about God. But apparently he didn't really grasp to know God. In all his years of ministry, he didn't understand the depth of God's love and mercy. He did his job. He went to Nineveh and preached. But he didn't do it out of compassion for the lost. God was about to give him a lesson about his heart that, at least up to now, hadn't sunk into Jonah. You see, here, Jonah is, is pretty pitiable. I used to use the word pitiful. But Jonah's not pitying anybody but himself here. So he's not full of pity. He's pitiable. I, I pity Jonah. See, see, I'm a child of the 60s. I remember the 18. I pity the fool. No. <laughs> and the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor and you did not make it grow. It came to being in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, a great city in which there are more than 120,000 people who do not know their right hand from the left? God challenged Jonah. He says, you pitied one soulless gourd that you didn't even make grow. It lived one day, and now you're mad at me for having compassion on 120,000 eternal souls. Jonah. Jonah was upset over the loss of a single day old plant, and yet he seemed to be unconcerned for the city of Nineveh and its 120,000 people. Now, I don't know exactly what happened to Jonah after this, but my expectation is that eventually his heart was broken over his lack of concern and his lack of compassion for these people. When I think about all the things that we assign value to, and often we assign more valuable than the souls of the lost, I'm willing to suggest God would like to break our hearts too. All around us, there are people who need to see their need for Jesus. Not just a desire for him, but a need. We need to be saved, don't we? There are kids outside here, that, outside these walls, that need to be taught that there is a God who loves them unconditionally. There are ministries with eternal value that need to be done Representing God and representing salvation to other people. Meanwhile, some of us sit and pout over the loss of some little shade plant. The whole book of this, the whole purpose of this book was to show the heart of compassion that God wanted Jonah to have. Jonah, his prophet, you, you need to have this heart. And this book ends without a conclusion. The question in verse 11 just kind of echoes down through time. Is it right, Jonah, for you to have pity on this gourd and not right for me to have pity on Nineveh? What was Jonah's answer? Exactly. There was no answer. I think God just didn't want us to forget the question. He left it out there for us. Is it right to have concern for all things comfortable, all things material, all things temporal, but no concern for those who have not heard the gospel? I want us to consider what God was getting at by posing that question to Jonah. It was a point he was making for our benefit as well as Jonah's. What's more important to you, your door or God's door? Your comfort or God's compassion? Are our material comforts and things more important than spiritual things in our lives? This is a profile that we use to contrast and consider. Are our material things 
no, let me state that. Our material things are here today, gone tomorrow. But the souls of the lost are also made in God's image, and they are forever. Is the temporal higher priority in our lives than the eternal? Do we really have an eternal perspective in life, or do we still think of earth as our home? You know, that's one of the hard things to do, isn't it? To, to, to grab a hold of an eternal perspective, or at least try to, but yet we think this is our home, so we just want to hang on to it and everything that goes with it. And yet, Scripture tells us what? This is not our home. We're only passing through. God spends all of our lives, whether it's 30 minutes or 100 years, he spends our lives getting us ready for home. I think God finally got through to Jonah. Made him realize that, that God has a, a huge heart, <laughs> full of love and compassion for his people. And, and Jonah had a heart like the Grinch, two sizes too small. That he was more concerned for Jonah than he was for others. And God wanted Jonah to have a heart more like his. He wanted Jonah's heart to grow up. And God wants the same for you and me. There's so many people who still need to hear about, Jonah, or about Jesus. There are kids who need help and instruction about growing their relationship with their creator. And living lives that bring him honor and glory. Do we have to love those people out there before we take the gospel to them? No. No. I think God says we don't. He just says, you go talk to them, and you teach them, and I'll help you learn to love them on the way. I saw that happen in my own personal life when <laughs> the first time I went to the former Soviet Union. I went as a, a tourist, member of a choir, I was curious, but I didn't necessarily have any love for any people in the Soviet Union. I'd, I'd just seen all those parades on TV with them goose-stepping and their nuclear missiles and all that stuff from the 60s. So I didn't necessarily love any of them <laughs> until I got to know them. I was there for two weeks on that first trip. And by the end of the two weeks, God broke my heart and I told the pastor there, I said, I don't know how <laughs> or why, or when, but I will come back. Thirty days later, God had me back for the second time. By the end of the year, I was there for the third time. And over the next few years, I went 26 times. And I went to learn to preach the gospel. I didn't cut my teeth in, in the pulpit here in America. I did it by traveling around the churches around the Odessa region of Ukraine. And I developed an incredible love for the lost. And that love has grown to people just not just in Ukraine and Russia, but our people in Africa that 1040i is working with right now. I've been to Africa, the continent. I just haven't been to Ivory Coast. And to Mexico, where our kids are going to go in a few weeks. There are lost everywhere, including here in Clovis. He just tells us to go, and he will help us love them. Remember, telling God, I'm ready, isn't nearly as important as when he says, he's ready. Because when he's ready, you, you should be. You better be. So I ask today, are, are, are we going to Nineveh? Or are we going to tell God, talk to the hand, I'm going to Tarshish? I'd advise against it. There aren't that many whales anymore. <laughs> Will we pursue our own comfort, our own material things, the doors that we've chosen for ourselves, or do we take the door that God has chosen for us? Do we choose to pursue God's compassion, his agenda, to take his message to our neighbors, starting right here with our own city and then the state and the world? 
this may surprise you, but there are a few people here in Clovis and Fresno and California who, who need to hear about the Lord. <laughs> there are a lot of them. I first came here, there are only 32,000 people in Clovis. Now there's well over 100,000. And I bet there's a few of them that haven't heard the gospel yet or, or some that haven't responded to it. God wants to grow our hearts. And he's assigned us to take his message out to this great city, to this state, Wherever it is that you go, we're supposed to take his gospel. He wants to raise his own compassion through us over our comfort and things. Now, our senior and associate pastors, Tim and Mark, are both even today in a place that for many of us would be extremely uncomfortable. It's hot, it's humid, there are not a lot of creature comforts. They're not over there having a party. Although, actually, their hearts, I'm sure, are very joyful to be doing what they're doing because they're taking the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who need to hear it. Way back in the, the ends of the earth, if you will, that the Great Commission talks about. But they're doing it because they love the lost. They love ministering to the lost and they love God and his compassionate heart and they want to share it they're telling and living out the love of God for the people on Ivory Coast now they didn't need and I don't think we need three days in the belly of a whale to move us to do that do we the idea of getting vomited up on shore just doesn't appeal to me very much so each one of us has a door in front of us of some sort. How, you, how will we respond to the doors that he calls us to go through? And that's the question I'm going to leave you with this morning. Would you pray? Lord, sometimes we, uh, we don't see the doors that you have in front of us because we're not looking for them. But they're not easily ignored especially doors like this that you open for Jonah because you told him, Jonah, this is the door I want you to go through and here's what I want you to do when you get there. And yet Jonah chose to pursue his own door. Lord, I'd pray that we, we not be so wrapped up in ourselves that we forget that we worship a God of compassion who has a number of people, millions of people, billions of people, that still need to hear and respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to your salvation. So, Lord, as you place those doors in front of us, may we be looking for the door and maybe be willing to walk through it and to take that message to our world. In Jesus' name, amen. Doors are going to open up. You can go out and take the gospel to everybody you meet. Amen. <laughs>